thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Eliza Kava. I'm the Director of Conservation at Audubon Naturalist Society. And this is Conservation Cafe. Conservation Cafe is our monthly, mostly monthly speaker series. And um, um, we are delighted, delighted to be able to invite um, all sorts of conservation folks, um, policy experts, advocates, uh, group leaders, who are mostly doing local work on protecting nature and making sure that people have access to it here in the DC area. Um, and one of the things that's most important about Conservation Cafe is that we are thinking about those um, social issues. We have another speaker series, Naturalist Hour, that really focuses on science and natural history. Conservation Cafe focuses on the people outside, whether it's policy, whether it's access, whether it's outreach, um, whether it's behavior or economics, those are all things that we bring into Conservation Cafe. So tonight, we're so delighted to have Richard Trent join us. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Richard and then let him introduce himself later as well as however he'd like to, but um, I met Richard on a beautiful, drizzly, but nonetheless beautiful warm evening in the late fall at Anacostia Park at the Skating Pavilion at night for late skate, which I had never been to before. I happened to have my in-laws in town babysitting they said, we'll take care of the kids. You guys go for a date. My wife and I went out to late skate that um, my friend Brenda Richardson had told me about. She said, you should really come. Oh my gosh, it was just, we had so much joy. It was like the most joy we had had in the entire pandemic was right. hanging out <laughs> at the late skate pavilion at Anacostia Park. And um, <clears throat> I have no idea how to skate. So all sorts of very nice gentlemen took, kept taking my arm and helping me get up and down the stairs. and. Um, and over grass and one and, and I met one gentleman who had a name tag on that said he was with Friends of Anacostia Park and I said he'd love to know more about Friends Group I knew it was getting started you know how's it going he started telling me all about it and then he said you should meet Richard and um, uh, and and I said oh Richard I don't know him I know Akima he said oh they're both here so Akima Price Richard will I'm sure tell you a little bit about um, so this gentleman whose name I'm not remembering Richard but he's on your board um, uh, held my arm as we went down the steps across the grass into the darkness where there were some candles and fairy lights under a tree at a picnic table. And there was the brain trust of Friends of Anacostia Park just off to the side of this amazing event that they had facilitated and then was just running on its own with the energy of community and music and laughter and wow. So anyway, I met Richard and I said, um, hey, we'd like to partner, we'd like to talk with you some more. Uh, I followed up, invited him to speak here at Conservation Cafe. And it turns out he's new to town, but he's lived here before and he has deep, deep connections in DC uh, and a lot of experience in the nonprofit sector on the fundraising side. Um, he's worked with arts organizations. He's worked with uh, youth pro organizations. He's worked with organizations um, that do prison reform. And um, he's bringing all those uh, pieces of experience together here at Anacostia Park. And um, so I think I'll tell you a little bit more about CAFE and then turn it over to Richard. So the ANS, our mission is to inspire residents of the greater Washington DC area to appreciate, understand and protect their natural environment through environmental education, through outdoor experiences, education and advocacy. And we really love our vision these days. The, the ANS seeks to create a larger and more diverse community of people who treasure the natural world and work to protect it. So with that, I will oops, stop sharing and turn it over to Richard with huge thanks and excitement for being here. Hello, beautiful people. I assume you're beautiful, <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a real honor to, to be here. I'm, I'm grateful, Eliza, that you even uh, invited me here. Um, I have been working with Friends of Anacostia as their inaugural executive director since uh, late June uh, of last year. Uh, and in that time, I have met hundreds of people, uh, had 250 plus meetings with uh, community activists, parents, church leaders, all these different groups somehow tethered to Anacostia Park, um, all stakeholders in its revitalization. Um, and after all these different conversations, um, it became abundantly clear that um, this isn't your typical friends group. Um, we're not like a the you know friends of Yosemite or friends of Grand Canyon. No shade to those friends groups. I'm sure they're wonderful, but they're they're uh, you know national parks guarding um, rural rural urban uh, rural treasures. You know 
we're a, a, a national park that is situated in a bustling, uh, a bustling city. Um, and so the implications of sort of the work that that friends group, uh, that a friends group governing and an urban national park, that, that, that work is slightly different. And um, we wanted to, to signal that to folks who might be interested in learning more about our work. And the only thing that kept coming to me was the, the JFK famous quote, ask not what, your, what, what, what uh, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And we sort of, in this uh, brainstorming session with folks from the community and our board members, flip this around uh, to really capture the symbi symbiotic nature of, of the work that we're doing, right? Um, we aren't simply uh, 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 people for the park, you know, people who are concerned with preservation and conservation. We're that, but we're also a park that's trying to look out for the surrounding community. Um, and you'll see in some of what, what I talk about that almost everything that we do, um, the work goes both ways. Um, so wherever there's an opportunity, um, for the community to own the revitalization effort, um, we, we look to sort of uh, activate the, the, the park space as a, as a platform for doing that work. Our mission, we enrich the lives of DC residents by preserving Anacostia Park and connecting surrounding communities to its redevelopment. So it's a, uh, Anacostia Park is, this, uh, it's a hidden gym. It's not even hidden. You know, it's, it's 1,100 acres. <laughs> you know, it's, it's 1,200 acres sprawling across the city. Um, and it's gorgeous, but it needs a lot of work. Uh, and I am astonished by, in the past, how much that work has been outsourced, um, how much the planning effort around um, the new developments in the park have been totally decoupled from the hopes, dreams, aspirations, concerns of the Ward 8 community. And so in, in creating this Friends Group, uh, what we're hoping to do is, is bring um, the revitalization effort back in harmony with uh, whatever it is that the community wants to see happen. Um, whether that's you know, connecting folks with job opportunities or um, leveraging the space as a, as a cross-cultural um, you know, communal space. Uh, we want to make sure that the community has ownership over the redevelopment effort. Uh, just a little bit of uh, context and history, sort of backstory. Um, we are starting off in a, in, a, in a pleasant place. I've had the pleasure of working for a lot of different grassroots organizations, a lot of them kind of operating in what I like to call emergency mode, you know, totally noble, beautiful missions, but oftentimes you know, cash strapped. <laughs> and so, and, and trying to figure out like, what, what's the, what's gonna be the next move because of the stewardship of, of the National Park Foundation and the National Park Service, um, we've been able to grow this organization gradually uh, and intentionally uh, over the last three years, which is uh, a position that uh, unfortunately a lot of nonprofits, they don't find themselves in. And so I have to sort of count my blessings and, and acknowledge our organizational privilege in that in that regard, just the fact that we've had two big institutional players um, looking out for us for the last three years. Um, and also we've had um, Akima Price um, function as a community liaison, building grassroots support for this friends group for the last three years. If you, if you know anything about Anacostia, you know that if you're trying to do something big, if you're trying to, if you're trying to pull something big off, then you have to have the buy-in of the surrounding community. Um, this, and, and so instead of just plopping a friends group down in the middle of Anacostia, like, ah, here you go, friends, <laughs> friends of Anacostia Park, uh, what the Park Foundation, what the National Park Foundation and the National Park Service uh, have done over the last three years are host events in the park, casual events, barbecues, cookouts, late skate, the late skates that Eliza talked about. Um, <laughs> And, and they, they carved out space for the community to ask questions about what this friends group might be, what it, you know, what it, what it could look like. Um, and because of Akima's leadership, um, first with organizing some of these casual events, but then growing it into more intentioned initiatives uh, like the Meaningful Engagement Cohort, which is sort of like the, the forefather, foremother progenitor of our Friends Corps, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, it's, it's really, really remarkable to see um, already how much uh, 
for lack of a better term, brand recognition there is in, in, in Ward 8. Um, how many people you'll, people you'll see sporting the I Love Anacostia, uh, Anacostia Park t-shirts. I need to get you one of those, Eliza, if you don't already have one. Um, but um, we've been, we're lucky in that we've, we found love in Anacostia pretty early on in our, in our organizational development. Um, the initial stated goals of, of this friends group coming from the National Park Service and the National Park Foundation uh, were to simply establish a model for, uh, for urban national parks. Um, I spoke a little bit about why we're slightly different than your typical friends group governing a, a national park. Um, we also uh, want, want to make sure that we're invigorating the historic business district. If you go to the intersection of MLK and Good Hope Road in Anacostia, you will see an intersection of promise, of, of enterprise, of um, you know, fledgling businesses that are, that are, <laughs> or sheerly by the, by the will and hard work of the, the operators running, running them. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we uh, were considering the park as, um, as an area where these, where these small businesses could go to, uh, to amplify their impact and, and kind of reach a wider audience. Um, we also want to make sure, of course, to provide memorable and exciting experiences for residents and visitors who, um, for, the, for the folks who I talk to on a regular basis, have been in Anacostia for decades, um, deserve, uh, deserve some memorable, exciting, and positive experiences uh, because they've lived in a community that has, um, for, for all intents and purposes, uh, stagnated economically. Um, over, over the last few decades, while the rest of the city um, has um, experienced uh, unbelievable um, economic prosperity. And so uh, we, we wanna make sure that we are, we're, we're focused on just providing a good time for those folks. I feel like I would be remiss though, if I did not acknowledge um, sort of the, the big elephant in the room, which is that um, revitalizing parks have implications for the home prices, uh, you know, abutting the park, right? Um, this was actually a GIF. Um, for some reason, it's not, uh, it's not moving, it's not shimmering, but the GIF, we, and we can upload the proper link uh, maybe a little bit later. Find it while you're talking, yeah. It's a really awesome map that shows, I'm not awesome, but, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's informative in the sense that it shows you um, just how much the, the black population around this, area um, of the park has decreased over the last few decades. Um, and so it's something that if you talk to a lot of Anacostia residents, uh, it, it's palpable. Uh, they feel it in the air that the neighborhood is changing around them. Um, and so uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't simply um, cleaning up the river, doing trail maintenance, removing invasive species. We're doing that stuff, but we couldn't just be that in Anacostia because it would be, a, it would be like a, a painful omission, I think, for, a lot, of the, for the, a lot of the residents in Ward 8. And so the big question started emerging um, amongst our board, amongst our closest um, advisors and, and folks from the community. Uh, how do we turn this restoration of the park into an opportunity for community uplift? How do we ensure that, um, the, that the revitalization effort and the re restoration of the park effort doesn't become, again, decoupled from the wants, hopes, dreams, aspirations of, of the surrounding community? So um, a, I have a little bit- If you want me to show it or I can just put the link in the chat. Oh yeah, yeah, show it, show it. Do I need to stop share? No, I got it. So here it is, 1980, and then it ticks forward. Can everybody see it? So fo Can yeah, see focus it? focus in on this little pocket in here and down here. Yeah, the lighter the excuse me, the lighter the lighter blues. You can see sort of an encroaching, right? That a lot of residents are kind of that, that they feel um, just with the way that the that the area is changing. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I'll go back to my. Uh... So a little bit more, just of the, the sort of theory and um, I guess research that backs some of our thinking in this work. 
um, Stuart T.A. Pickett. You guys probably know him better than I do. I'm not an ecology whiz. I am not, uh, I will not even try to fake it. Um, I am very much flying by the seat of my pants and learning as much as I can every single day. Um, that's part, partly why I'm so excited and invigorated by the, by the promise of a partnership with Audubon Naturalist Society because you guys are the nature experts and we have so much to learn, uh, myself included. Um, but I was really, really moved by um, this bit of research that I found from Stuart T.A. Pickett, who teaches, or who's a senior scientist at the Cary Institute in Millbrook, New York. Uh, he um, draws a distinction between um, what he calls the ecology in the city, right, which is your tr traditional focus on the animals, plants, um, and how they're all working together in the city. Uh, to, he draws a distinction between that idea and the ecology of the city which considers more how the plants and animals are interacting with the humans, right? And, and all these other so, uh, social ecological systems that make up um, a city. And it speaks perfectly to, you know, what we're about as an organization, not simply considering all the conservation and, and preservation um, issues uh, pertinent to Anacostia Park, but how those, how those same issues um, and the work surrounding them actually impacts um, the Ward 7 and Ward 8 community um, right by the park. A little bit about uh, the history. Um, I think it's important to talk a little history just to get familiar with um, the dynamism that's characterized <laughs> that whole region for the last 500 plus, you know, 400, 500 plus years. Um, and uh, I also want to encourage you once we get it set up um, and stay tuned and keep checking on our website, but we're, all, we're actually going to be working with the National Park Service uh, this summer to organize um, walking history tours uh, of, of Anacostia Park with Ranger Vince. You'll see a picture of Ranger Vince later. Um, everything that I've learned about Anacostia Park history, um, Ward 8 uh, more gener generally, um, I've learned from, from Ranger Vince. He's a really, really sharp guy. Um, and you all need to meet him. Um, but anyway, um, the, the earliest known inhabitants of this region um, that we now call Anacostia were the Nacoch Tank tribe, um, who are a tribe of the, the Algonquin. Um, and they were living good. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were thriving on um, the abundance of game and fish. Um, and um, I think that the governor of Maryland uh, he called the area like one of the best places to trade in the entire region, the, the Leonard Calvert. Um, and um, the, the name itself, um, Anacostia, comes from uh, this uh, old Algonquin word meaning um, center trading village or trading, trading village center. Um, so it was a bustling um, epicenter of enterprise um, at, at the time. Um, and then um, in 1608, uh, John Smith is reported to have walked his way down the exact same path um, that it, it um, aligns with where Good Hope Road is today in Anacostia Park. Um, and it really signaled the, the beginning of, of European settlement in that region. Um, by 1668, um, you have uh, most of the Nacoch tank who had been residing around Bowling Air Force Base, that, that sort of area. Um, they had moved um, across the river and kind of scattered and were uh, running for their lives. Um, and it ushered in a, a totally new era of hyper-industrialization. Um, by 1799, early 1800s, um, the Navy Yard is built um, and shipbuilding begins and coal gasification begins. And the pollution of the Anacostia River um, really, really kicks up. Um, the War of 1812, um, I think it was 1814, you've got um, British troops encroaching um, and um, Commander Ting, Tingi, Tingi um, demanded that, um, the, that all the ships stationed at the Navy Yard be burned down so that the British couldn't capture them and take them for themselves. So in, in cleaning up the, the river sediment, folks have found cannonballs, you know, old pieces of ships that withered and sank two centuries ago. Um, and, you know, that may 
sound, I guess, somewhat romantic if you're kind of a history buff, but it has serious implications for the for the health and toxicity levels of the actual sediment at the bottom of <laughs> at the bottom of the river. Um, by the early 1900s, when the when the it was commissioned that this park actually be built, um, a, a significant portion of the watershed um, was destroyed uh, just by the dredging of the of the river uh, in order to build these th th these seawalls. Um, so um, all the sediment was poured into uh, was poured into the wetlands, um, and uh, it, it sort of signaled the beginning of of, of a huge problem, which is just the destruction um, of, of, of those wetlands, of that watershed. Um, by 1932, a really interesting piece of history, you've got um, 11,000 uh, members of what was called the Bonus Expeditionary Forces. Uh, these were folks who were World War I veterans um, who were really feeling it, just trying to survive in the middle of in, in the Great Depression um, and demanding um, early payment of, of a bonus that um, well, the White House and Congress had been debating whether or not they really had enough money in the Treasury to pay for this bonus. They've been debating it for years. The, the bonus army demanded payment uh, of, this, of this bonus. Um, so President Hoover at the time, um, along with uh, um, a younger Dwight Eisenhower, who was sort of leading the army forces, um, they sweep into the, the, the bonus army is stationed in modern day uh, Anacostia Park. Um, Hoover and, force, and, and Eisenhower and forces move into Anacostia Park, burn down these, uh, the, this encampment that, uh, of some shanties, really, of cardboard boxes, uh, cardboard boxed homes that 11,000 people had been living in. Um, they burn it all down to the ground, um, and uh, they never they don't pay uh, the bonus. Needless, <laughs> needless to say, um, and uh, it was um, it was interesting because that the, the eleven thousand folks that were living there, they, it's estimated that up to forty thousand people at any given moment were actually protesting and 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 demonstrating right in Anacostia Park at that time. Um, by nineteen forty nine. Um, as um, more and more of the federal government, the government is being desegregated. Um, the Department of Interior demands that the six pools that are in that were in the district at the time be desegregated as well. So in 1949, you have the desegregation of Anacostia Pool. Um, if you've ever been to Anacostia Park, it's now where the, the Department of Parks and Recreation building is. You guys should definitely go when it's hot out. It's really, really great. They've got a rock climbing wall over there. It's amazing. All these things you don't know, right? So um, you go. So the, the the pool desegregates in 1949. You've got um, some black families with I don't even know how they muster the courage. I, I don't understand. It, it's unfathomable the courage of these families, these black families who go to who, who are the first movers, right? Who go to this pool um, and are terrorized uh, by white residents of of, of the area. Um, or black families come in hopes of just sort of pushing through um, and it escalates into violence. Um, ultimately, you've got you know, a couple people who are arrested, who are arrested, no one is, is technically killed, um, but the government continues to hold firm that the pool should be desegregated. Um, and if you've ever, if you've read Heather McGee's book, came out last year, The Sum of Us, um, a big part of her book is talking about how desegregation across the country resulted in a lot of white citizens kind of withdrawing from certain um, aspects of society. And she, she uses the swimming pool, the swimming pools across the country as the this, this site of, of white withdrawal. DC is actually the, the exception to that, um, in that um, uh, the, the pool remained um, uh, desegregated. Um, and you did have for a period of time there black and white residents who, who were using the pool, though it is said that white resident um, use of the pool did Sort of drop off, and um, oh yeah. So by 1952-1964, you've got the construction of I-295. Um, I, the construction of I-295, we talk about it a lot in the park because it cut off the residents. But you know, of course, it's great to have interstates and highways and be able to move freely. But it, the the construction of it actually cut off a lot of residents from the park. You know, so this park that was once this kind of 
cozy backyard national park, um, there's a huge impediment in the way now. And we still actually struggle with some of those access issues today and are trying to work um, with different partners to, to problem solve around, around that access issue. Picture of the, the bonus expeditionary forces, by the way. Pretty disgruntled. And <laughs> as well, they should, should have been. Um, but where are we today? Uh, 1,100 sprawling acres, 1,300 different plant and animal species. Um, if, you, if you go to the park, you are guaranteed, guaranteed to see some herons, especially if you're on the water. I've taken many a boat tour with Anacostia Watershed Society. Um, and um, you can reach out to me separately if you're interested in organizing something like that. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's really remarkable um, that there's just so much vibrancy and, and, uh, and wildlife living and thriving on the Anacostia River. The river is still very, very far from being, uh, it not, it, it's, it's, making, it's making its way, right? It got its first passing grade um, in terms of river cleanliness a few years back. Um, and we're moving every single day closer to the river being swimmable and fishable. Um, but um, it, it still has its struggles, but the, the animals are still thriving there. The trees are still thriving all along the shoreline, all throughout the park. Cherry trees, milkweed. Um, in, our, in our soft launch ceremony, we planted an oak tree. Um, you've got ongoing rehabilitation of the three declared circle sites. That's um, the Washington Gas Site, uh, the Navy Yard, and Poplar Point. Um, so ongoing remediation there. Um, you've got the Anacostia River Tunnel, which is uh, reduced uh, pollution in the river, in, the river um, in, in a short period of time by over 90%. Um, in the, but the area is still, it's still predominantly black. Um, there's, still, uh, there's still challenges of persistent unemployment. Um, only about 25% of, of, of Ward 8 residents actually own their homes. Um, so the, the implications, again, the cost implications around, or the home price implications around park revitalization really um, hit hard for those folks who are not homeowners in Ward 8. Um, you also have higher rates of obesity, hypertension, and diabetes um, in Ward 8, which is why access to this park is crucial, because in addition to be, being a source of, of mental respite and uh, commun you know, communal gathering space, um, it's also an important recess just for a uh, resource for um, physical health of, of the surrounding uh, community. It's one of those great blue herons. I wish I took this picture. Hey, buddy. <laughs> but the common thread, whether it's, it's, it's the, the, the animals that are still thriving or the residents like Lorraine here who runs the hand dancers Hand Dancers DC, always posted up outside the Anacostia Skating Pavilion. The common thread um, is resilience. Um, th this is a community uh, defined by resilience. Uh, people keep going. Animals keep thriving. Um, the community keeps growing. Um, and so we're trying to figure out the best ways to, to channel and harness that resilience um, for some of uh, what we're hoping to accomplish as an organization. So at the, at the end of the day, what, we, what we're about is, is working with the National Park Service as their official philanthropic partner to restore the natural and built environment of the park and to connect the community to the park. This is Ranger Vince, who I was talking about, who has taught me a lot about Anacostia history. Really, really good dude. Um, and he's here. This looks like one of our late skates um, dancing with uh, a Ward 8 resident. So how do we um, accomplish this, this goal of, of connecting the community to the park and ensuring that they own the redevelopment effort? A um, couple ways. So I, I wanna start by talking about the Friends Corps, which is our central program. Um, this was built out of what I mentioned earlier, the meaningful engagement cohort that, um, that Akima Price helped develop in partnership with, in, with the, the National Park Foundation. With a meaningful engagement cohort, that sort of progenitor or, uh, institution, um, Akima identified folks from low-income housing in Ward 7 and Ward 8. She provided them with some, um, some basic just park knowledge, training, some of the stuff that I'm talking about with you today, um, 
and um, conducted rigorous interviews for these folks who, who really, really wanted to have a positive impact on Anacostia Park, all from the community. Um, and um, they were um, paid for their time. At that time, um, I think they were, they were only being paid in, in, in gift cards. Um, but the program since then, um, over the last year, has grown into um, a workforce development program, and we're trying to uh, continue build it, uh, you know, build it out, and identify the proper partners for um, ensuring that the program. Way, where we are now, we've got um, we're hiring five folks this year. We've got the three folks returning, um, but we want to hire. We we have budget, <laughs> we have budgeted for for only two more positions, but I'm optimistic that we're gonna. Um, uh, fundraise uh, for, for more Friends Corps positions because it really is the core piece of our programming of empowering residents to actually take ownership over the park, to be park stewards, to be concierges, to have a friendly, a friendly face when you come into the park, but also to do the tough work of invasive species removal, of wetland restoration, of, of maintenance on the skating pavilion. The Friends Corps is doing all those things and they're being paid a living wage for their time. Um, and so uh, we're, we're they also own all the other aspects of programming that I'll talk about. I feel like you were raising your hand, Eliza. Oh, sorry. No, I have bronchitis and I'm trying not to oh. talk all over the place. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, so the Friends Corps is, is our core program. Um, and uh, you might see some pictures of some Friends Corps in a second. Um, but they own all the other aspects of, of Friends of Anacostia Park programming. One of the other aspects of programming that we're really, really excited about this year, just because um, is, is our residency program. So with the residency program, you know that most friends groups across the country, they have like a calendar of events or, you know, come down to the park for a basket weave, weaving on Tuesday or, you know, or, or uh, you know, a trash pickup next, uh, next month. Um, we want to do the same thing. Obviously, we want to have a nice um, uh, full events calendar. But we want to pay residents from Ward 7 and Ward 8 to actually power um, all the activities um, on that events calendar. And so that's our residency program. There's so much untapped wisdom, um, untapped expertise in Ward 7 and Ward 8. And so what we're trying to do with this residency program is, is leverage community assets, right? These folks who, who are um, healers, uh, artists, painters, um, trainers, right? Like we, we want to take those folks um, and we want to give them a platform in the park to actually share their expertise um, with, the, with the community. Um, and we want to pay them for it. Um, the other big prong of, uh, of Friends of Anacostia Park programming is our partner programs. We need to figure out some better branding for that, but for, for now it's fine. Um, that, that includes the late skate that Eliza talked about before. Um, these are large scale events that really um, activate the park as a, as a convening point for, for Washingtonians, um, but especially for Ward 7 and Ward 8 uh, residents. Um, so the late skates were huge. This was in September and October, three weekends uh, during the fall when we welcomed at least uh, 300, 400 people out to the pavilion at each event um, for food, music, of course, skating, though Eliza and I are both actually pretty, you don't skate, right, Eliza? I don't, I'm a rollerblader, right? And so I feel like I would just get made fun of, you know, but actually there's a bustling community of rollerbladers at the late skates. And I'm going to like, I'm going to fit in with those, with those people because the four wheelers, I feel like, I feel like a moron every single time I get on four wheelers. I can't be, I can't be smooth. Richard, you don't need to be actually be smooth on rollerblades. You don't need to be smooth, be brave. I showed up. <laughs> two white women who did not know how to roller skate, not one bit. Everybody was so nice to us. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and they're very good. Somebody literally knocked over my wife from behind, caught her and picked her back up and put her on her feet before she even touched the ground. Like That's... very, very good. They can take care of it if you're not smooth. <laughs> you guys gotta come out though to, to see these late skates. Some other um, ideas that are in the works. Um, we, we'd love to bring a maker's market to, to Anacostia Park. Um, that, that's a wrinkle on sort of the traditional farmer's market um, where we actually include some cultural elements, some performances um, to increase the draw of the actual farmer's market because much of Anacostia, many Anacostia residents are living in what was essentially a food desert um, in terms of not having access to um, high quality, low cost uh, 
uh, produce um, and, and protein. Uh, so we, we definitely want to make sure that we're leveraging the park for um, connecting residents with, um, uh, with, with good food. Um, we're, we're hoping to work with a couple of different organizations, especially ones that, that accept SNAP, right? So that everyone can participate in this farmer's market. Um, but um, if you have some big ideas around programming um, and um, you think that Anacostia Park could be uh, a, a, a relevant, a good site for, for that event, it's worth reaching out to me and let's, let's have a conversation about it. Um, we are, um, and, I, and I invite you to just stay tuned and, uh, and keep checking in on our website for updates on, on our events calendar. Um, the, real, the core of, of a lot of our work though is around projects that we do in partnership with the National Park Service. So again, as the philanthropic partner of the National Park Service, we listen to what Anacostians are saying they wanna see in the park. We work with the National Park Service to get approval for those, for those improvements to the natural and built environment. And then we fundraise for it. Um, so uh, the, the overwhelming thing that you'll hear, hear a lot of residents talk about are bathrooms. I mean, and it's, it's something very, very basic. And it speaks sadly to um, inequities still in just the way that resources are distributed across, um, across the institutions governing the park. But it, you've got bathrooms that are still in, in disarray. And uh, I think it's hard for some residents to full of, feel a full sense of pride in the park when something as simple as the bathroom is in together. And so um, that's where organizations like, like us come in because I, I know, I know what, the, what the balance sheet looks, I know what the budget looks like and the National Park Service is doing the best that they can with a, a very, very cash strapped situation. And so uh, as, a, as the, the fundraising partner of the National Park Service, um, we're hoping to bolster a lot of the work that, that the National Park Service is already doing. Um, so, um, of course, the focus is on fixing, ba fixing bathrooms this year, um, but we want to think differently and we want to think bigger in terms of what we can actually see in the park. Um, the community has been weighing in um, through a process called the Development Concept Plan or Reimagine Anacostia Park um, for, since last July. Um, we, we're hearing from the community they want to see more shade in the park. They want to see um, refurbished recreational spaces. They want to see more grills, more awnings, more, um, more picnic areas. Um, and so the community has really weighed in and we're still working with the Park Service um, to, uh, to sort of help guide that process. Here's some members of our, uh, the hand dancers. The hand dancers are mostly seniors uh, from Ward 7 and Ward 8 um, who are down in the park every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, like clockwork unbelievable people um, who honestly are one of our most important constituencies in the park and, and we do anything for these guys. Um, here's some footage, here's a, here's a picture from the late skate. So Anacostia Skating Pavilion is, first of all, Anacostia Park, I believe, is the only national park in the entire national park system with a skating pavilion. Um, so we're unbelievably lucky. The late skates were really cool because you got a lot of kids who want to skate in Ward 7 and Ward 8, but they don't actually have skates themselves. And so you can kind of see in the back there, um, the sort of cylindrical building, that's actually the skate rental facility. So you just walk up, uh, kids get free skate rentals. Um, and we had hundreds of kids out at these events. This was earlier on in, early on in the day. Um, by, the, by the evening, there was a massive crowd. So um, it's really, really beautiful. Oh, sorry. I have a question. Late skate is really cool because it's a party, but you can skate anytime with your own skates, right? Year round and the skate rentals are open during the day, during the summer, regardless of the late part, right? I just wanted to make sure that people knew that. They weren't, they weren't, the skate rentals were not available during COVID times, mm -hmm. um, but we're working with the National Park Service to make sure that that skate rental area is fully staffed um, um, Monday through, or we're still working out the calendar, but it'll be most of the week, essentially. Great. Oh, here's my guy. This is Mr. This is Mr. Holmes. So Mr. Holmes is one of our Friends Corps members, Ward uh, Ward Eight resident. For uh, I don't want to, just in case he's on this call or something like that. I don't want to call out his age because he'll, he'll give me crap for it. But um, 
Mr. Holmes is, um, he's honestly a mentor of mine. He, he's taught me so much about the river. Um, he's shared so many stories about his childhood growing up on the river. Um, and I, I put him here because he really, um, he symbolizes what so much of our work is about, right? Which is folks who have been investing in this park for decades, totally unnoticed. And now the area is being revitalized. It's up and coming. And all of a sudden folks are paying attention to Anacostia Park. That's great. We love the attention, um, but it's important to make sure that we're tapping into the expertise, um, into the wisdom of folks like Mr. Holmes who have been loving this park for decades. So he runs our friends, uh, he, he runs our friends corps essentially. Is, uh, we, we're trying to deputize him and make him a senior manager this year if, if, if he'll have us. Um, and he's teaching here um, uh, a young Ward 8 resident um, how to fish. Um, he's actually gonna be piloting our community fishing program this year, which we're really, really excited about. Um, so that'll be fishing most days of the week. Again, stay tuned and keep checking in on our website. Um, but teaching folks from the community how to fish um, and um, sharing uh, information with them about all the different species that are in the water, with, you know, who's, what, what animals are coming back to the region because of the revitalization effort. So we're really, really excited about community fishing and uh, we, we love Mr. Holmes. I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Holmes who walked me over the grass to meet you. Oh yeah, that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so what's in the works? I mentioned the development concept plan with the National Park Service. Again, this is the chance for community members from, um, actually all Washingtonians can weigh in. But we're really pushing Ward 7 and Ward 8 residents to weigh in just about what they want to see in the park, whether it's a newly built amphitheater or whether it's, um, you know, better basketball courts. We want to hear from the community. Um, and so if you, if you have some ideas, if you've been to Anacostia Park, if you love the park, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me and just share your feedback. Um, better yet, go to our website um, and click on the Let's Be Friends link, which I will show you now. There you go. There's the rain again. Click, just click on this Let's Be Friends link. It's moving slow. Oh, don't go to the Squarespace. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, go to friends of Anacostia Park, uh, org, and click on the Let's Be Friends link and please fill out the form. Let us know what you're thinking about Anacostia Park or, or how you would like the park to serve you. Um, we're again piloting the, uh, not, well, not piloting, we're, we're powering the late skates this year, but we'll have more than three events. It'll be more like uh, nine across all the summer months. Um, I mentioned community, our community fishing program. We're also working with the National Reentry Network to organize restorative justice circles uh, for formerly incarcerated folks coming back to the area. Um, the park is a really crucial, again, source of mental health respite. Um, and we wanna make sure that these folks that are coming back to the community can um, go into nature and feel like it's a safe space for them. Um, we're also working with, uh, um, hoping, hoping to work with um, some of those businesses that I mentioned on the, in the, um, Anacostia City Center and the Anacostia Business Improvement District to build out this idea of a cultural district um, that really activates the park as, as a cultural space. Um, so we want to have screen on the green type events. We want to have open mics at the, at the skating pavilion or around the skating pavilion. Um, we want to have concerts. And there's actually the Anacostia River Festival um, that we're, um, uh, we'll be volunteering at, um, organized by the 11th Street Bridge Park. Um, I don't have the date off the top of my head. I believe it's April 11th, but please look it up and don't quote me on that. Um, but please come out for that. Um, if you're interested in hosting a cleanup, um, if you, if Audubon Naturalist Society, if you're connected to that organization and want to do like a walking nature tour, just pointing out animals, if you know the area and the ecology well, talk to us, reach out to us and figure out how we can partner in a meaningful way. Um, but uh, again, I'm really, really grateful um, that you guys were able to carve out some space for me to share uh, my enthusiasm uh, and, and uh, the vitality of our mission with, with you folks. Um, I'll leave you with a quote from Dennis Chestnut, um, who, formerly of uh, Groundworks DC, um, who I'm trying to make my mentor. Um, and um, his quote was, if, if the people aren't healthy, then the river will never be healthy. Um, and that, that sentiment really lives at the core of our work. We believe that 
um, the residents of, of, of Ward 7 and Ward 8 are those that are actually best poised to lead the revitalization effort. Um, and it, it works both ways. The more beautiful the park gets, the more um, um, the, the, the more informed and, and connected stewards of the land um, that will actually be taking over this restoration effort. So I thank you for your time. I've already gone on too long, but um, hopefully you guys have some questions for me. Oh, you went for the perfect amount of time, Richard. Thank you. That was really just wonderful. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, it's just us. So, um, so Tom is going to come on with a question, um, and I'll let him ask first because it's a political question. But then I have so many questions to ask you, and so many ideas for partnerships. Maybe some of them we'll just do offline. But um, I'll encourage Tom to go ahead and ask your question. And folks, you can put up your hand to be called upon to talk, or you can put your question in the Q and A, which will give me just I might put it in an order that way, any of those ways, and uh, you'll receive a little invitation to talk, to turn on your camera and microphone when it's time to ask. So go ahead, Tom. Hey, hi, can you hear me? This is Tom. Yep. Hey, Tom. Great, hey, Richard, fantastic presentation. Really enjoyed it, uh, learned tons. Uh, exciting, you're good at getting people fired up about something. Um, my questions are kind of, I'm, they're not very well formed, but I just maybe talk about if there's anything where the redistricting affected you. And um, I threw in there kind of a, a funny question about, gee, what if we, DC became a state? Would that help? Um, and then finally, maybe just kind of this more, more serious one or something to play with a little bit in terms of how far can sponsors go? You said you need bathrooms. I love bathrooms. Um, can, uh, can like Kohler sponsor a bathroom? Can Home Depot sponsor a bathroom? How, you know, I hate seeing corporate names all over our national parks, but dang it, a bathroom's important. I'll shut up and take my answer. <laughs> so I've got redistricting, statehood, and sponsors. So Yes, yes. So um, redistricting, great question. Um, as some of you may know that um, the, ward, uh, the wards east of the river have expanded to include um, some, some neighborhoods right around the capital, uh, which was formerly Ward 6, I believe. Um, right. And we are, um, this is exciting because this actually um, really, it, it, it puts our mission to the test, right? Like so, so, so much of what we're supposed to be doing as an organization is bridging the cultural divide um, that exists be, um, between west of the river and east of the river, right? How can the park be leveraged um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a point of cross-cultural exchange? Um, the redistricting effort means that the, the basket of stakeholders who are connected to um, the, the restoration of Anacostia Park, it grows ever wider. And so um, it means that our ability to sort of build consensus um, in a culturally relevant and compassionate way, uh, it, 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 that gets tested now, right? And so it's really, really up to um, folks like Mr. Holmes, who even though he grew up in predominantly black um, Ward 8 um, is one of the most impassioned and informed spokesper spokespeople for the, the revitalization of the park across cultural barriers like Mr. Holmes loves everybody. Um, communicators like Mr. Holmes are going to be crucial to making sure that that um, bridging the gap, uh, that cultural gap effort, that, that it actually, um, it, it, that it goes well. Um, as far as statehood is concerned, well, I, I don't. I haven't actually thought about it that much. I do know that um, if DC becomes a state, then it would shift the balance in Congress around the passage of thing of, of sort of, you know, like bigger infrastructure, like Build Back Better type stuff. I'm, I'm not trying to signal any sort of partisan whatever, but I, I, there are serious implications um, for the park embedded in those bills. There was 20 million. There's 20 billion dollars allocated at one point um, in Build Back Better for uh, reconnecting communities to parks um, that have been cut off by, um, by interstates that have been built through their community. That, is, that literally is Anacostia. Anacostia, you've got residents, I mentioned this earlier, cut off from the park from, 290, uh, from, from Anacostia Park after the construction of I-295. If there was a critical mass of, frankly, democratic um, uh, Demo Democratic representatives uh, in, in, in Congress who could pass something like a build back better, like a big bill, a big bill like that, 
inevitably there would be more funding, um, I, I'd imagine, that would filter down to, to this sort of more granular level of park revitalization. Um, and so we're, that, the only real thought that I have about that is that I know that there was $20 billion, it got slashed to $1 billion, um, and we need more money for stuff like that because $1 billion does not go very far when you've got all these urban parks suffering from the same challenges around sort of uh, inequity and in infrastructure of design. Um, the last one is, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go I was gonna jump on that because how about the Great American Outdoors Act that passed in 2019? I know that has money in it for National oh. Capital Parks. Is, is that either gonna go to Anacostia Park? Absolutely, well, so that's still being sort of filtered down through all the different um, um, sort of institution, government institutions in the area. So we can, I mean, we can apply for funding through certain you know, RFAs or, or you know, RFPs um, that, that is that money that you're talking about, sure. Okay. And, we, and we will this year. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, 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 oh and yeah, the, last, the, last, the last question was around, was around sponsors. So um, the sponsor thing is tricky because as a person who's worked in fundraising for a while, I know the rub with, with sponsors, you know, obviously there's a, there's a connection to the mission, but um, sometimes if, especially if you're um, a developing company, you'd love the brand recognition of being able to sponsor something um, while also do uh, and have your, your name on something while also doing a good thing. Um, it's a little trickier in the park. We can't have big, you know, sponsored by such and such on anything in the park. Um, but we, um, we, there are opportunities around sort of one-off events where that sort of thing is more permissible. Um, it just can't be like evergreen, like, um, you know, statues or uh, things that exist in the park. But there is some flexibility that I'm really just sort of um, learning about, just watching how the Anacostia River Festival is coming together. So if, you, if, you, if you're connected to an organization that's interested in some sort of corporate sponsorship opportunity, we can talk about all the different, you know, permutations of what that might look like, whether it's, you know, adopting a specific part of the park um, or um, working specifically um, with, a, with a cohort of schools who are nearby who come down regularly to the park. There's a lot of flexibility and we wanna make sure that we leave space to, to work that out with folks that are interested in supporting. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I have a quick sort of logistics question for you. Uh, a history question actually, if you know it from Marion. Um, she wanted to know when did the CX, CSX line go through Ward 7 and North? Because that's another piece of infrastructure that cuts off portions of the park from the community. <clears throat> You're totally right. I do not know. Mm -hmm. I do not know. And this is where my, my blind spots start to, to come out. <laughs> but but I, I guarantee you, Ranger Vince, Ranger Vince knows. <laughs> I bet he does. <laughs> but, oh, I uh, bet he does. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll look into it and maybe can can share it with the uh, uh, is, is there going to like a like a listserv or, or a group email after oh, this? Um, I, yes, I will be sending out with the recording is ready a list of um, sort of some of the notes and resources and links we've shared. So if you want to share the answer, then you can. But also, if you don't already know Marion Dombrowski, you're going to meet her soon, and then you can just answer the answer her question um, while in a small rowing shell or over. Marion, I, Marion, I feel like we've met, and also I I saw that you uh, you became a friend of Anacostia Park today. Okay, she said she wanted me to ask the question, but I just feel like Marion would probably like to chit chat with you a little bit. So I turned her on to uh, accept, she wants to accept the invitation to become a panelist. She'll pop in and say hello. Oh, I think she's coming on now. I think she's coming. Yes, I became a friend today. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. I, I well, saw that in my email and I was like, yes, very Yeah, cool. I've been a friend for a long time. I just uh, what's up, what's up? made it official today. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we, we, we're excited to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Marion Marion is a longtime champion of the Anacostia River and um, particularly from the perspective of leading the rowing clubs and teams that um, that come out of some of the boathouses. Oh, okay. Yeah, Absolutely. I coach little kids to row. I coach big kids too, but uh, yeah, I, I row out of the uh, Blainsburg Waterfront Park. Gotcha, um, gotcha. I I'm, I'm, you might have seen me biking up there uh, one morning. I know I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh -huh. uh, let's 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 definitely connect offline though. Uh, uh, we'll let's do on. that. I took down your email address, and I I can put mine in the chat too. Oh, Perfect. I guess you, it's on you, the you, sh you shared you shared it in the in the with the lesbian right, friends. Right, right. I got you. Okay, thank you. Wonderful yeah, to meet you. Nice to meet you, Richard. 
All right, our next question is gonna come from Josefina Dumbia. Josefina, oh, you got your video on, great. <laughs> hey, Josefina. Oh, you're, you're muted, you're muted. muted. I was practicing, okay. <laughs> Excellent, uh, you know, Richard, incredibly excited and, and amazing presentation full of energy and possibilities and expectations. I, I just have a question about the connection with um, the uh, Anacostia commun Community Museum. I have been following them, you know, and now through the COVID days on this community uh, farming initiative that they have where they have this guy, which is from the core of Anacostia, and he really loves his tomatoes and his onions and motivates people and, and you know, and train them. And so it is so much into the community. And so if, when I hear you, it is sort of, sort of this incredibly amazing synergy, you know, this is the, the Smithsonian is behind this. And so how are you and whether you are really looking and linking with them? Because I think that there is a lot there also going on for you know for these two words uh, so i'm just curious to know of any connection or any links that you have uh, with them that's a that's a really really great question and please if you have not been to the smithsonian's uh, anacostia community museum go yes. ASAP. Oh, it's, it's totally it's, oh it's absolutely it's remarkable so Josefina, it's it's uh, it's actually uh, interesting that you said that because uh, katrina lashley and i are meeting next week um with the park rangers um, so there's definitely a collaboration in the works. I know that they've already been working with Anacostia high school students. Um, and basically, if I understand this correctly, they are um, trying to activate Anacostia high school students as kind of like um, roving historical curators in the park. Um, so they're going like, they're, they're actually paying full, uh, high school students to go in the park, do some historical information gathering from folks in the park to create this sort of living exhibit. Um, so I, I know that that's already in the works with Anacostia High School, uh, but we're trying to figure out um, something. And I think this connects to that idea of a cultural district that we're trying to bring to Anacostia Park. But I think the idea of, of uh, outdoor exhibition um, or out, outdoor exhibit or some sort of like living community museum um, that's uh, set up in the park is a, is a really, really exciting idea. Um, but we'll see where sort of Katrina's ideas and, and our ideas align. But that, that, mm. that's, that partnership is certainly in the works. Potential of lots of synergies, you know, wonderful. It's great to hear. Yeah, wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Josefina. Okay, so everybody now has seen what it means to be able to come on and ask your questions. Uh, and then um, when you're done, I I'll, I'll move you back to being an attendee and you can rejoin that way. So if anyone else has questions, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A or just raise your hand and I'll call on you. But in the meantime, now my questions. So um, um, first of all, I'm just, you mentioned so many ideas for different groups you'd like to connect with. And I, I, just, I just put a whole list down of people I wanna make sure you're in touch with, which uh, I can tell you offline. But, um, but one that really struck me was Ward 8 Woods. Um, Nate Harrington's project, uh, well, he's the executive director, he's not the only one whose project it is, sounds very similar to a lot of what you're um, trying to do with your community core um, group around stewardship of the park and, um, you know, and providing local residents with a living wage to do local work and take care of the spaces. So I wonder if there's a partnership or a synergy there um, to have Ward 8 Woods come in and do some of that work while you're still filling out your core or uh, you know, find people joint employment opportunities between the two of you to get them full time. If you can both only get part time, have you guys mm -hmm. had any creative conversations like that? We haven't yet, but we, but we are mutually connected to um, Phil Pinnell of the Anacostia Coordinating Council, and um, I'm extremely confident that um, that Phil will help sort of broker a, a partnership there because there's uh, an undeniable amount of overlap between uh, the work that both of our organizations are doing. So I think you're you're, you're spot on that connection just hasn't happened yet, but it will. Yeah. And Nate has um, is a master naturalist that trained at Audubon Naturalist Society last year. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to get some more of his um, his staff to come into our master naturalist program and learn about all the nature they've got, uh, that, that we all have going around us in our region. And um, uh, so that kind of partnership is something we can, we can talk about as well. We're looking on building out a scholarship program for our master naturalist 
um, which costs a couple hundred dollars, but um, uh, the grants we have submitted would include a stipend as well for participants to be able to come in so that they can speak with lots of learning about the nature that you know is, is in the parks around them. So that's something I'd love to. That sounds uh, awesome. Yeah, please yeah. tell me more about that scholarship program. I, I might have, is, is it on the Ottoman Naturalist? Society no, it doesn't, ex it doesn't exist yet. It's, it's doesn't in exist. the works okay. to, to find funding, but uh, we think it's a great idea and that we can find funding for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to circle around on was um, resilience. And you said that the people of Anacostia and the wildlife and plants of Anacostia have a lot of resilience. And I totally agree that they do, but resilience is something you get when you've been done bad a lot over and over and over. And, you know, in conversations that I have with, with folks, sometimes people say, yes, we're resilient. We're really good at being resilient. But we're also really tired of being resilient and we wanna be like lucky, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> or, or, you know, we're on top, you know, we want to, we want to just, you know, have it a little uh, easier or express our power in a way that is, um, uh, that is impactful and doesn't require banging our heads against a wall quite so much. So I was wondering what you hear when you talk with people and they describe themselves as resilient or they describe kind of what they want in the future. Um, do you get the sense that, um, that resilient is something that, um, well, I guess how well does that word really describe how people want to be um, mm. around Anacostia Park? Amazing question. Whether when or not that's I, how they really have been, you know, what, what when they want for the future. When I first met Brenda Richardson, and if you don't know Brenda, Brenda, she runs uh, Friends of Oxen Run, um, and also um, Women Like Us, another nonprofit. Um, when I first met Brenda, and she was kind of like feeling me out, like. What, you know, what's this guy's vibe? Like, he's not really DC, whatever. And so um, I asked her, Brenda, how are you doing? Like, how's everything going? And she said, Richard, I'm so tired. And then launched into this, this long, um, just testament to the work that she's done for years in the area. Um, yet, she still sees so much that needs to be done. And so um, the reason I think that she was, she brought that up was because she kind of ended the note saying that like young upstart organizations like yours have to be the energy, right? That carry us across the finish line. Cause you got a lot of these folks in the community who've been doing this work for years and are tired. And to your point, the, this resiliency narrative, I, I, I do sometimes hesitate in deploying it because it has been used to basically paint over decades of mistreatment of, of institutional institutional neglect, right? Um, and uh, so it's your point is your point is taken. But I do think that there's I do think that there's um, for better or for worse a sense of of pride around that resilience, right? That you can you can throw anything at us and we'll be okay. But that that they even need to feel that pride speaks right. to how massive the systemic and the, the system, systemic imbalance actually is. And yeah. so it's one of those things where you kind of have to feel two things at once, right? It, it, of, of course, these folks from the community are some of the strongest people I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, but it's unfair that they have to be so strong. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that struck me as we're talking about these inequities is the renting versus owning. And um, I mentioned to you just before we started that Scott Katz of the 11th Street Bridge Project um, spoke with us at Conservation Cafe a couple of years ago before we recorded them. Um, yep. And one of the things he talked about was working with community land trusts to help build some more um, land-based wealth so that as inevitably, as has already started and is continuing quickly, property values rising with gentrification in Ward 7 and 8 is something that at least a small, number more people can take advantage of as a benefit to themselves instead of as something that forces them out as rents rise and they yeah. don't have equity. Um, and I mean, it's just a tricky, tricky, tricky challenge. So, I, you know, what do you hear from people? Are they, are people, what kinds of hesitations do people have when they think about the park becoming more exciting, more revitalized, more attractive? Does it scare folks um, to know that that could be coming or is it something that they want? you know, universally kind of, how does it, what do you, what do you hear from the community when you talk about these ideas and people think about what it might do for their housing? 
-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, first of all, kudos to 11th Street Bridge Park for actually speaking to this issue. And, and uh, I know that through their partnership with MANA DC, um, that they've managed to um, um, Push at least, uh, at least I believe like 50 or 60 families into home ownership who otherwise you know didn't think that they could own a home, didn't think it was their lane, um, but now are homeowners. So um, this sort of thing can happen. Um, there's a part of me that wants to figure out all the ways an organization like ours can be a panacea for all of Ward 7 and Ward 8's socioeconomic challenges. Um, unfortunately, that'll condemn us to the inevitable mission creep right yeah, yeah, and so yeah, yeah. and so um we have to understand our lane and recognize what it is that we can do around things uh, or around housing so we can certainly um again turn the park into um, a place where folks know they can get the resources they need whether that's information whether that's man someone like man at dc tabling at a late skate that thing that, that makes a difference right because so much of 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 uh, what, what has people in Ward 7 and Ward 8 falling through the cracks is just asymmetries in information and folks not knowing, oh, we didn't know that we could do this. We didn't know that this was a possibility. And mm -hmm. so the park can be activated as, as, an, inf as an informational hub. Um, so yeah. we, know that, we know that we can do that. We also know that we can um, put a, a small dent in, in, the, in the employment challenges, uh, unemployment challenges, I, I should say, that Ward 8 has, right? Even as we're approaching three or four percent unemployment uh, nationally, um, you've, you've still got double digit unemployment in Ward 8. So um, it's a persistent challenge. Um, we want to grow our Friends Corps into a proper green jobs um, training program, right? So my big vision five, 10 years down the road is that Anacostia Park can be the, a staging ground for the creation of green jobs where folks can get some training um, just by being a Friends Corps member for a year or two, and then we plug them into a career uh, somewhere else, right? Uh, and, and they get training through us and through our partners. Um, so that's like the big vision for Friends of Anacostia Park. But right now we're talking something meager, right? We're talking uh, five part-time jobs, another full-time position this year. That's not gonna, that's not gonna stave off, uh, you know, impending green gentrification. Um, but what I'm what we're hearing from the community as it pertains to gentrification is really around um, it's around the stories that are being told right so 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 much of so much of uh, what is lost in gentrification obviously there's the economic there's the, the losing the houses but um, again for, for 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 some folks in this community um, who we decide to honor in the park right. Mm -hmm is a big thing and it has implications around gentrification if you have if you have new monuments going up if you've got new exhibits new art going up there needs to be a sense that the community that the that the people that built this neighborhood right the black the black citizens that actually built up anacostia um and the and the native tribes going going way back that they're honored for their contributions in the very least and so i think so much of what i hear as it pertains to gentrification is around just narrative, right? Like who is being honored, what stories will remain. Um, but um, yeah, there's there's obviously bigger implications around um, around home ownership. So much of, of, of the work that really needs to be done. I, I mentioned before that 75% of folks in Ward 7 and Ward 8 are, are renters, um, which is scary. Um, so what we need to make sure that the, the 25% who, who are, um, you know, or black or, or BIPOC um, homeowners in Ward 8 that they can hold on, right? As if they've been, if they've been, if they've had their home for many, many years, um, we want to connect them with the proper resources. And, and again, Man in DC is an organization that can do that, that can ensure that these folks hold on and don't sell to something, to, don't sell an appreciating asset, right? Um, so again, we're, we're a hub, we're a connector. Uh, but we are not the, 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 the solution to all of Ward 8's uh, social challenges. Of course not, yeah. Um, but one thing that you are and can be, you've talked about it briefly, is mental health um, benefits. And this is something that Brenda Richardson with Friends of Oxford Run Park talks about all the time, is the incredible um, 
mental health, physical health, of course, but also mental health benefits of spending time in nature and at a, at a nearby park where you feel comfortable. And you and I, when we were talking last week, we're talking about the returning citizen population, which is another area where Ward 7 and 8, Ward 8, I think, especially differ from the rest of the city in terms of um, the higher proportion of people who have come back from prison or jail and coming back into the community. And we, you and I talked about a lot of programs for returning citizens sort of start and end with job training, but how do you keep a job if you've got, you know, trauma circling your head all the time? You you don't have your, you know, ability to focus um, uh, that's been, you know, lost for so long. So could you talk a little bit about um, uh, those benefits of, uh, to anybody who needs mental health benefits, spending time in nature, but specifically um, a group that's, that is in a high proportion near the, near the park, which is those returning citizens. Like how will they benefit and what's your program going to be like? I swear, I swear you just, I swear the spirit of Akima just descended, descended over you. <laughs> that, that, that's <laughs> all, you just, you just channeled Akima big time. Um, when, so my job before this, I was the chief development officer for an organization called the National Winter Activity Center. They are a New Jersey based organization that connects kids, um, mostly uh, black and brown um, from uh, Camden, um, Newark, uh, East Orange, uh, all the way up to Harlem in the Bronx. They connect them with um, access to outdoor experiences, especially during the winter months when most kids are holed up inside. And I, I have to admit that I did not see my career moving in the direction of environmental education, outdoor education, until I started working with this organization. And I saw all these kids um, from, from tough, tough neighborhoods, tough neighborhoods, they get off the bus paralyzed by fear because they see this massive snowy mountain in front of them. And they're, they're told, oh, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to go down that hill in a couple of days, you know, and um, they're paralyzed by fear when they get off the buses by the, by the end of their sessions in this program, um, they're high-fiving. They've, they've like tapped into a sense of confidence and purpose that they didn't even know was there. And so it was in seeing that work that I really saw uh, the transformative potential of outdoor exposure, plainly. Um, how we're trying to, to bring that same sort of transformative power to Anacostia Park. Um, luckily, Anacostia Park makes it easy just because of how, stun how naturally stunning and beautiful it is. Um, but we're talking about a lot of different things. Um, first, um, one of the big challenges, and we heard this from Courtney Stewart, who runs the National Reentry Network, one of the big challenges for some of these uh, formerly incarcerated folks returning home um, is just reconnecting with their family in a meaningful way, right? And, re and not having it feel weird. Um, there's no better place to do that than in Anacostia Park, um, either at a late skate or with a guided activity, um, but something where, the, where, where, where fathers especially um, can feel a sense of agency after being taken away from, 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 from their families for a while. Um, we, so we're trying to uh, work with the National Reentry Network. I mentioned the restorative justice circles. Some of that, uh, some of what we'll, we'll accomplish there, they, they already do these restorative justice circles. We basically just want to carve out a space in the park that's dedicated specifically to that purpose that, they, that they'll start having regular outdoor sessions in. Um, we talked with Akima about having these um, environmental education book bags that are not so like, uh, you know, not for folks that may be struggling with uh, illiteracy and things like that. We don't want to, um, you know, turn this into an embarrassing moment for a parent who, who can't read necessarily. Um, so we're trying to develop um, a, a curriculum that basically exposes, uh, that, that allows parents um, or caregivers to lead uh, environmental education activities and, and animal identification activities with their kids in this sort of care package, book bag. Um, we want to do um, respite walks with the teachers of Anacostia High School because you know damn well they need it. <laughs> any, any teacher you talk to, you know they need some respite, some outdoor, some outdoor relaxation. So we're trying to work with uh, Principal Haith um, to organize regular wellness walks uh, for the teachers of Anacostia High School and also for the student population there. So the kids need to get outdoors. They already um, were planning something like a, a Friday 
I forget what he called it, but like a Friday activity basically to get kids' minds off of the week before the, the week before. Um, and we want to we want to do the same thing with those kids. Just have music, a carved out space in the park that's dedicated to them, um, where they know they can go and have a good time. And it really, really is transformative uh, when um, a young person, especially who's who's or or an older person who's who's endured trauma, when they can find that release. Um, in nature. And so we're trying to look for all the, the pertinent opportunities to do that with all the pertinent partners. Wow, that, it's all so cool. And it just keeps making me think about um, nature walks and bringing our- You guys, got, you guys got to come lead a nature walk this year, man. Yep, yep. We we're, we're working on it. So Jamani Overby, who is our DC conservation advocate, was all about being here tonight. And she had her own list of questions, but she ended up having to um, uh, take care of some health challenges in her family. And, um, but one of the things about Jamani is that she, um, she grew up hand dancing with her grandma and aunts and uncles. So she's, oh my uh, God. I, I know if she was here, she definitely would have jumped on that. So <laughs> she's, oh, she's got to come Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. The hand dancers are outside of Anacostas skating. Field. They, I still see some of them out there today. I still go to the park, you know, a couple times a week, but, um, the hand dancers are still out there, especially once it gets a little warmer though, they're in full effect. You got to come see it. Yeah. You know, I have a question for you that's about the wildlife and the and nature. So mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a great report a couple of years ago that if you haven't seen it, I'll dig it up and send it to you. Um, Marion might have it at the tip of her, her keyboard as well on subsistence fishing in Anacostia River. Um, mm -hmm. And it talked about the motivations of people who like to fish in Anacostia and whether they're catch and release or they eat. A lot of people eat. That's, I mean, that's what makes it subsistence. A lot of yeah. people eat fish that they catch out of the Anacostia River, but then they are... Um, exposed to those quite high body burdens of pollution that the fish in Anacostia are likely to have based on um, what the sediment is carrying in it, um, yeah. including some nasty, nasty old stuff as you were talking about from the shipyards and things. Um, so I wonder if that's something that you've thought about um, doing any education on or uh, thinking about as you do your fishing program, um, because it's, 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 it's striking, this comes up in indigenous communities as well, who it says, subsistence fishing is key. Like It's like a lifeblood and it's a way to put food and bring food on the table that you don't have to spend money on. Um, yeah. You know, and you have this, this, all of these things are in this wonderful report, this sense of empowerment that you're feeding your family, being a provider to your friends. And yet you're also bringing these toxins into people's bodies. Um, that's really, really hard to square with the otherwise wonderful messages of fishing for food. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if that's something that, um, that you're working with the park service on as you think about doing fishing nights or, um, or like if people are aware of it, what's the awareness level of folks who are UC fishing? Do they worry about it? Do they mostly do catch and release? So uh, I, it's interesting that you asked that. Mr. Holmes has a buddy who's helped out with a couple uh, fishing sessions um, who swears it's totally okay to eat the fish in the Anacostia River because he's healthy, right? And yeah. he's 60 years old and he, you know, he looks good and all these things. Um, I would not eat the fish out of the Anacostia River right now. I do not advise that anyone eat fish out of the Anacostia River. I don't think that Anacostia Watershed um, and Riverkeeper um, or DOEE would advise eating the fish out of the Anacostia River at this time. Again, the Anacostia just got a passing grade of D plus for the first time in many, many years, um, just a few years ago. Um, that means that you've still got um, an unbelievable amount of storm water uh, <laughs> So you, you've still you've still got 25% of the watershed that is imp impermeable surfaces, all right? You've still got so much um, um, fecal matter running off into the water. Um, I would not eat fish out of the water. And this is why it's crucial that we partner with folks like Fresh Farm DC for this maker's market, with folks like Martha's Table who've been providing low cost to free groceries for families in Ward 7 and Ward 8 for many, many years. Um, so highlighting partners like that that are doing uh, God's work, frankly, of, of providing families with, with, with the food that they need to survive, um, giving, giving them that platform in the park is where I want to direct more of my energy instead of telling folks that they should be eating fish out of the river. But we, you know, I think that the, the, it's enticing, this notion that we could just walk down to the Anacostia and fish and have it be fine. We're still a couple years off from that. Um, and we're just asking folks to be, be patient, um, to pitch in uh, with us, um, and, to, and to connect with, um, with, with high quality 
food providers like a, like a Martha's Table or also an organization, Families for Families. And um, DC Greens might. Um, oh, DC Greens well. is another great one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is this is the last chance. If anybody would like to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand because we always end conservation cafes right on time at 8.30, um, especially when both the speaker and the host have uh, babies who are not <laughs> properly to sleep. <laughs> uh, Richard is a new father, everyone. So big congratulations. Thank you. Um, so um, yeah, any last moments if anybody wants to raise their hand. Um, and I'll just say, you know, a huge thank you. I have a, I have a closing slide and remark I'd like to make, but I'll turn it over to you, Richard, if there's any, any last things you wanna um, to bring up or to, to ask um, of me or of us? Well, definitely Autumn and Naturalist Society. You guys got to come out and, and lead some nature walks with us. We're excited to partner with you in a, in a meaningful and intentional way this year. Um, and anyone that's listened to this conversation um, that has a, an idea that, that they want to see come to life in, in Anacostia Park, I encourage you to reach out and let's make it happen. Um, it is exciting times in Anacostia Park, um, and we, we need to do everything in our power to make sure that the community continues to own that redevelopment effort. So I just, um, uh, yeah, I encourage you to reach out and, and let's, let's connect. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone, so much for coming. And thank you again. Thanks, Richard. Thanks to our audience.